Good evening and welcome to the Free North Church in Inverness. I'm Angus McRae, I'm the minister of the congregation and it's lovely to have you with us for our Sunday at 6 service tonight. I'm particularly delighted that we're going to share some live singing with you featuring some members of our congregation this evening as part of our worship. Wherever you are, may God draw near to us and show us his face in his Son, Jesus Christ. Our call to worship this evening comes from the first chapter in Revelation. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, even Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth, Glory to him who loves us and has freed us from his own sins by his blood. Amen. On these Sunday evenings, we're thinking about the gospel, about the gospel as our treasure and our passion and our vision. And our theme this evening is to have a vision for the victory of Jesus Christ over all this world so that the nations and the peoples of the nations come to him. There is a fight, and so we look for cosmic vision tonight and for the fight that wins the world. Not our fight, but the fight of Jesus. Father, we pray now that we will have your help to focus on you, to worship. Help everyone taking part in this service and help us in our various homes to enter into worship and to know you and to love you. May grace come to us from Jesus Christ, the one who is and the one who ever will be, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead. Be with us, we pray, and give us your love, your strength, and your help to worship as we should. Amen. So I invite Catherine, Donnie, and Anne to lead us in Psalm 18 from Sing Psalms. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. It's lovely to be able to get a little bit more into normal church life and to be able to hear the praises of God being sung. The king over God's people in the line of David is Jesus Christ, and we're going to praise him now and approach him in prayer. Having sung, the Lord lives. Praise be to my rock, my Savior God exalted be. Father, we believe in the dominion of Jesus Christ. We believe that before your Son, Jesus, you have promised that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. We know that there is an enemy who defies you and despises you. And from the very beginning of the history of our world who has lied about you, deceiving countless millions. We know that our first parents, Adam and Eve, believed the lie and so broke covenant with you. Come to us, Lord, through your Son and renew and restore us into a right relationship with you where you are Lord and where we delight in you. Give to your King great victories. Give to Jesus victory over darkness and fear and sadness and death. Give to Jesus victory over our own fear about sharing the gospel with others. As we look forward to Easter time, and indeed as we look forward to public worship resuming, God willing, in a few weeks from now, we ask that you will show us how to share the light of the Lord, not just online, but in personal ways. We ask you to bless the book of the month for March, both a book to help us in our evangelism and a book to give to friends. And may the story of the death and the resurrection of Jesus thrill us and come with a new freshness to those who do not yet believe. We commit to you any who have drifted or grown cold. We commit to you those going through hard times. We commit to you those facing appointments and treatments in the days and weeks to come. We commit to you those grieving the loss of loved ones. We commit to you those who are receiving hospital or hospice care, both in our congregation here and known to us. We also commend to you Trevor and the community in Carluc Baptist Church as they are so concerned for their pastor. Lord, you hear our prayers. We pray that you will be at work in our city and in our nation, and that you will get the honor and the glory. And in these evenings, when we're thinking about the gospel, we turn to you, the only one who can give faith and obedience and hope and new life. Help us to be thinking of people to pray for, and help us in the fellowship time afterwards to pray big, for you are a great God. Hear us pardon us, have fellowship with us through Christ the Lord. Amen. As we turn to God's Word, we're going back to the passage we read from a couple of Sunday nights ago in Genesis chapter 3. Not the whole passage that we read last time, but some verses from Genesis 3, and then a short reading from the last chapter in the book of Romans 16. Let's hear God's word. Roman, uh, Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden 
in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The snake deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the snake, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And especially verse 15. And I will put enmity, hostility, between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 16, verse 16, we read, Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. In verse 20 especially, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. So we're turning to these passages, particularly Genesis 3 verse 15, but bearing in mind that last verse that we read in Romans 16 as well theme tonight is to have vision, a vision for the world, for creation, for the cosmos under the rule of Christ, the fight that wins the world. I started reflecting with you a couple of Sunday evenings ago about the dominion that God has over all things, over all creation a dominion that he extended to his image-bearer, Adam, and the descendants of Adam and Eve. God created a beautiful environment, a garden, and it was his intention that that garden would be filled with people who were under God's leadership and kingship and authority. And God's plan was that as people would grow and multiply that they would bring glory to God in every part of life. Of course, the fall, the sin that Adam and Eve committed in turning away from God has seemingly brought disaster upon that plan. And yet God's plans always work out. It was always God's plan to move from the garden to the city to the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, to the city pictured at the end of the Bible, which is like a garden city, like a temple, but a city full of people where there's no death, no sighing, no crying, no tears. And between that garden of Eden and that garden city of New Jerusalem at the beginning and end of the Bible is struggle, a fight, a conflict between Christ, the seed of the woman, and the enemy of your soul and of my soul, Satan. 
So the first thing I want us to notice as we reflect on this tonight and go a bit further into it is that because of sin, we expect a struggle. We expect a struggle. We're not in the Garden of Eden anymore. And although I love Inverness and its surroundings, it is touched by the curse and by rebellion. There's going to be frustration if you're a student, if you're at college or at school or at university. You won't find it easy to study or to write or to pass exams. If you're learning a musical instrument, you'll have to practice and practice and you'll find that uh, your, your fingers and your mind and your memory struggle to master these things. And yet the struggle is worth it. Because God gets honor and glory as we gain skill and as we do things well. Whether it's raising a crop or raising a family or building a city, God wants life in this world to be under his dominion and to bring him glory. And our role as a gospel-centered church is to see what God is doing and what God is building, and not to see work as drudgery, not to see work as part of the curse, but to understand that work for the glory of God is good, but it is affected by the curse. And whether we're well or unwell, whether we're retired or in employment or still young, at whatever age and stage we are, we are called to fill this world with the glory of God and to demonstrate the rule and the love of God, the nearness and the care of God over everything. The temptation for churches is that we turn inwards. You've maybe heard the phrase, circle the wagons. The world is in a bad place. The culture's in a bad place. So we'll just talk to ourselves, and look inwards. But if we believe that God created this whole globe, then whether it's the slums in the Philippines where children are in poverty and are often exploited, whether it's the slums of the great cities of Latin America, whether it's the great mega cities of Los Angeles or of London or New York, or whether it's rural parts of our own Scotland, Orkney, Shetland, the Hebrides, God is building a people and a kingdom. And our vision, despite struggle, our vision is to see every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that Jesus is Lord. Now we are where God has placed us, we have the knowledge and the experience and the strengths and the opportunities that God has given us. Do we believe that he's placed a king on David's throne and that none of his enemies can stand up to him? We sang that in Psalm 18. Do we believe it? Do we believe that Jesus is Lord? If we believe that Jesus is Lord, then we will fight in the Christian fight. Part of that fight will be for personal holiness and maturity. And part of that will be to stop the rot that's around us in the culture. Part of that fight will be to come alongside those who are being unfairly treated or exploited. We're living in a terribly selfish, inward-looking, narcissistic era. That's the way we tend to be, and that's the way, indeed, recent generations have tended to be. But God wants us to struggle for a God-honoring, godly community where we love people, respect people, value people, and call them into the family of God. What we saw a fortnight ago was that God looks upon humanity and sees two families, two seeds. Those who follow Satan, the liar, the seed of the serpent. 
Those who believe the gospel, who trust in Christ, the seed of the woman. And there's a leader to both these families, Christ and the devil. Everybody hearing this talk is following a leader. One of the, the things that uh, folk doing the wonder, works were in, wonder walks were encouraged to do was to think about the disciples who were called by Jesus and uh, to play a game on their walk. Follow my leader. Are we honestly able to say today that the leader that we follow is Jesus? Or are we following the father of lies? Because of our sin and the sin that is around us, there will have to be a struggle if it is Christ that we are going to follow. We should expect struggle. We're the image bearers made by God for God, and therefore we will experience conflict and difficulty. And the reason for that conflict is that the, the, the followers of the liar, Satan, they want dominion in this world for their leader. They want the world to believe a lie. I spoke in the morning service about ISIS and the caliphate and, and what have you, the, the agonies that Iraq went through and that Syria is still going through. And I vividly remember people marching on the streets of London in support of these bloodthirsty um, ideologies of militant Islamism. And there were people carrying placards around on the, the streets of our capital city of London. And the, the placard said, Islam will dominate the world. That's what these people believe. I think they're wrong. I hope they're wrong. Because a world dominated by their version of Islam would be a very uncomfortable place for anyone who stepped out of line. But what I believe as a Christian who reads my Bible is that Jesus is Lord. And that not only in the future, but that today, all authority is his. The Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel is our standing instruction, our standing order for the church. Go into all the world, making disciples, baptizing, teaching, sharing Christ and his word with people. We don't give up on the world. We don't give up on young people. We don't give up on teenagers. We don't give up on those who may be grown cold and drifted away from church. We don't give up because, in the words of the old psalm, the earth belongs unto the Lord and all that it contains, the world that is inhabited and all besides it. Everything, people, cities, they're Christ's. We want this city for Christ, for his glory, so we will and we must enter into struggle. The second teaching point flows out of that first one about struggle, and it is that because of Jesus, we expect to win. Why are we going to think about training in evangelism? Why do we have a book of the month about sharing our faith with others? Why do we think about plans for the next few weeks and months, especially as, God willing, we come out of lockdown to, to raise high the name of Jesus, lift high the name of Jesus in this city, in this place? Why do we do these things? Because we know from Genesis 3.15 how the story of the world ends. The serpent will be crushed. He does not win. If the future of the gospel in Inverness depended on you or on me or on this congregation, we might tremble and think, oh dear, things are maybe going to be sugarly. 
But we believe that the future of the gospel in this place depends on Jesus and his sovereignty and his victory. And so it's not pointless to pray, and it's not pointless to witness. It's not pointless to read the Bible one-on-one with somebody. It's not pointless to give a good book to somebody, because Jesus will win. We read at the end of Romans 16, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The man who wrote these words was in and out of prison for his faith. But he believed it and he lived it. Someone wins. Who wins at the end of your Bible? It's not the serpent. It's the seed of the woman. I'd like to read to you some verses as we come towards the the close from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And they explain to us how we get the victory, how we expect to win. Having read from Genesis, we know that death and sadness and disaster came upon our world through the sin of one man and one woman. But there is a new leader for humanity, another and a last Adam, and he's our hope. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in its turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. And he, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Where's your victory? Where's your hope for victory going to come from? From the one who defeats death and sin and the grave. It was by a man, a man, another Adam, that God's victory came. And he gives us a message and he gives us something to share. Someone who loved our race enough to come among us and to become one of us and to die to redeem the lost. His reward, which he has earned and which he deserves, is the message of Easter. Sometimes we hurry too quickly at Christmas to go straight to Easter. We need both Christmas and Easter. I've been reading a really interesting book by Bruce Ritchie, one of the local um, C of S ministers who teaches at HTC. He wrote a book about Tom Torrance recently. And he stresses in that book that we need Bethlehem and Calvary. We need them both. God became a man to lead a renewed humanity. Glory to God for that. I want people to say five, ten, fifty years from now that God's church in Inverness helped this city to flourish and to be beautiful and to be a place where human life is better and is loved and is valued and protected because that's the dominion of Jesus that we believe in. Salvation of souls, yes. Forgiveness of sins, yes. Hope for the hopeless, yes. But also transformation. I want people to be able to go to the plant and the ferry, to go to the Mark Inch and say, What beautiful things God is doing in this place and among these people. 
And then people will maybe ask, what is this good news? What is this gospel that you believers have that is transforming lives and hopes? I want our schools. I want our parliament. I want our local authority. I want our health service and our nursing homes transformed. Because God's people in this city believe that Jesus is Lord and that he has the grace and the power and the authority to turn the upside-down world the right way round. Do you believe this? Christ already has the victory. Let's call on him, and let's share him with others. Thank you, Father, that you have promised that you will bruise and that you will crush Satan, that liar, that serpent, under the feet of your believing people because of the victory of Jesus. May we have vision for this world becoming a garden city, a city of the Lord, the new Jerusalem. May we pray and work for global mission, for local mission. May we have great confidence in your gospel, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The moment we're going to sing our closing song, which is, O Church, Arise, full of the truth we've been thinking about this morning and this evening. And afterwards, if you're able to come to the fellowship on Zoom, we'll be thinking about praying to our great and victorious God. O Church, Arise.
Yours, Lord, is the triumph. Yours, Lord, is the glory. And we offer up ourselves to you. May we serve you in union with Christ, your Son. Grace, mercy, and peace be with us now and with all God's people everywhere, from Father, Son, and Spirit, one God, everlasting. Amen.